Welcome back to the Automation Podcast, the world's number one industrial automation product and technology show thanks to you, our audience of highly skilled automation professionals. Thank you for being a member of our audience and thank you for tuning back in this week. Now, if you do enjoy this series, please consider giving this episode a like as it's the only proven way for us to grow our audience and find new vendors to come on the show. Now, with that said, if you're new to the show, my name is Sean Tierney, and my company is Insights and Automation. And each week, I invite a new guest to come on the show to talk to us about their industrial automation products and technologies. And during the show, I play the role of the audience, asking questions I think you might have, as well as adding my own comments and questions based on my experience in the industry. And given that over a quarter of our audience listens to the show, if our guest is using visuals, I'll try to call attention to any of the details that I think the listen-only audience may want to know about. But this week, there's going to be no visuals because I'm interviewing Ronnie from MicroSci, very interesting company and products. So without further ado, let's learn what MicroSci can do to help you and your facility. Ronnie, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on, you know, I know you're here to talk about AI and vision and robotics, three topics we cover a lot on in my content. But before we actually jump in and start talking about specifically what you and your colleagues do, could you please first introduce yourself to our audience? Yes. Hi, Sean. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, My name is uh, Ronnie Fuine. I am uh, one of the founders of Microbes Industries. Uh, We do a... um, software that controls robots and makes them do things that otherwise they wouldn't be doing. Uh, So you would have to use a human instead of automation for it. Um, I'm 45 years old to my own perpetual surprise. Um, I have a background in uh, computer science and uh, philosophy actually, which was a bit of a random choice I made in high school that I would study these subjects. And then uh, at university, I discovered there's very few intersections where sort of you meet the same people. Um, and uh, the intersection is, one of the intersections is AI. Um, so very early on in my studies, I was sort of became part of a group of people who thought about um, uh, how to make systems intelligent, or more importantly, what even is intelligence, right? What um, What's this weird property of some systems that changes everything when it shows up and makes everything more awesome? Um, how do you understand it and how do you build it? Because if you know how to build it, um, you know what it is, right? Um, so that's been uh, sort of, there was, a, there was a group of people who thought about these things at university. And from that group of people, um, a bunch of things happened, one of which is Microbes Industries, uh, the company that does that. We're not originally robotics people, we're AI people. Um, we were always interested in systems that don't know what they will be doing when they leave the lab. Um, so these systems that learn what to do in the field and then looking for meaningful things to do with that, um, we sort of stumbled upon robotics where we realized, oh, wait a second, in science fiction, robots do all sorts of things. In actual factories, they move from A to B and you need to know A and B. Um, and sometimes you've taken a measurement for where B is with a camera, uh, but that's as far as it will go. Uh, sort of the real sensor-driven real-time motion uh, for robots, which would obviously be useful for many things in assembly or testing, nobody's doing. And then I had this moment at a car factory in southern Germany uh, where I was just walking around pointing at people and saying, why why is this a high-paid Bavarian Um, and not a robot? And then they told me, and I said, I I think we can make that happen. We can build what you would need uh, to automate this. And that's uh, how the company and how the product came about. Uh, company has been around for 10 years, six of which were um, research, uh, and then two of which were dealing with a certain pandemic. Uh, and then um, after, after, after that, we've been out there um, selling and scaling the system. You know, it's really interesting that you say that. I, and I think some of the people listening are like me too, where we think about why, like the why, like whenever I use software, and again, going back to my my uh, Apple II and my Commodore VIC-20, why did they put this button here? Why is this feature hidden? Why is the setting not something I, you know, and there's a lot of that in automation too. And it's very frustrating when somebody comes over and says, well, can't you make it do that? And it's kind of like say, you know, and I would always tell them, it's like, well, can't you just make your own vehicle from scratch? Like 
you want a Ferrari? Just make one, right? It's that kind of silly. You know, it's like, yeah, the programming that you need to do and the information you need to have can be mind-boggling to do some tasks. And, of course, we have a lot of integrators uh, listening in who actually have to come up with that code. And we have a lot of users who actually get to see that code in both its probably best and worst <laughs> iterations. But so I think it's very interesting because in robotics, right, it's just not as easy as like a lot of systems are just A and B, right? A and B, A and B. And, you know, one of the things we've seen with AI coming out is, you know, in the past we would, we would teach a photo eye, we'd have a self-teach feature in it. We'd put up the good product, self-teach, bad product, self-teach. And that would get us maybe 80% of the way there. Not, you know, we'd have to do a lot of tweaking. But today with AI and like vision, a lot of times we show it three or four products and it's good to go. So I'm very interested to see how you guys are implementing uh, these technologies today and what you're doing. Yeah. So um, first of all, what does the product actually do? Right. Um, it gets your tool, whatever your tool is, you're free to choose. Um, to where it needs to do work um, on the end of a robot, right? So we bring the tool. If the tool does an assembly, right, you take a part and you uh, make an assembly step somewhere, you plug something in, you um, click something in, um, uh, you, um, it, any, you know, be it a cable uh, or be it a plastic part uh, or be it a part that you put into a machine where um, some future uh, additional process uh, step happens, or your tool is uh, sort of a probe and you do some sort of measuring, an electrical test, um, a chemical sort of a sniffing test uh, is, a, is an application we've done. So essentially we get the tool where it needs to be. Um, and we don't dis do this from a library of known tasks because in manufacturing it doesn't work because many of the tasks that robots driven by our product uh, are, are doing it, it exist in maybe five factories uh, because the parts you're uh, you're dealing with or the problem you're dealing with is very specific uh, to this industry or even this uh, manufacturer. So the key thing is the product is trainable by humans. Um, and um, to sort of my standard routine to explain um, what the difference is to what you're already familiar with, you know, may so I've seen cameras, they tell me where to move the robot as well. So what's the difference here is, um, think think about um, you want to plug in a cable into a phone. Maybe you've just made the phone and you want to charge it. Um, so what traditionally you would have done um, in that problem, you would have gotten a 3D camera, which is already a fairly expensive system, um, and a slow system. It's really expensive, it's fast, but typically it takes two seconds or so. And it gives you a point cloud, and then you have a 3D model of the phone, and then you fit the phone into the point cloud that you get with some fast sort of fitting algorithm. And it gives you a precise position of the phone in 60, right? Three space dimensions and three rotations. And then you have a trajectory generation algorithm that the robot typically brings um, and you um, make a single delivery motion with the robot. So if you got the measurement wrong by half a degree, that motion will fail and you'll scratch the phone um, and you'll need to turn out the red light and the engineer needs to come and save the robot. Uh, from what is yeah. just done. So everybody hates these systems because they're brittle and they're fragile and they're hard to tweak and you sort of keep iterating on individual parameters and uh, list all the exception cases and then uh, maybe your time of flight based and sunlight is a problem. So it's a very, very brittle system. People don't like to do this type of uh, stuff. So it's essentially you only do this if it's your last option. And famously, you know, in car manufacturing, a certain American electrical car maker has bought hundreds of robots, um, made very strong statements about alien dreadnoughts and light out factories. Um, and now they're making these cars in tents with humans. I've been to the tent, um, so uh, it's still there. Um, so, right, if you get this wrong, uh, then you're not getting anything from the automation. In fact, uh, you're getting yourself in deep trouble. Okay, now I am a human and I'm extremely good at plugging in cables. I do this every day um, yep. and it's yep. not a problem for me at all. Um, why am I, and I, I don't even have a measurement in 6D uh, to a tenth of a degree precision in rotation in base coordinates of my left arm. And yet I'm so much better. Why is that? How is that possible? What's the difference? 
Um, and the difference is I am not, as a human, solving the extremely hard engineer problem of taking a super precise measurement. I'm just plugging in. And when I'm saying I'm just plugging in is what I'm doing. I'm moving towards the goal in a very imprecise manner. And I make small corrective motions as I get closer. And this actually gets easier the closer I come because I see what the corrective movement is more easily because I'm closer, right? I don't need to do this from 50 centimeters difference. So this precise capability to correct a robot motion um, as I approach the target um, and get all the uh, stability and predictability and reliability benefits and precision benefits from doing it that way, um, we give to industrial robots. Um, and the catch is we don't do it for just cables, but for anything you can demonstrate to a robot by showing it the target position or showing it the actual motion it would need to make. So you can train the system yourself with any tool, with any camera configuration on the wrist or statically outside that um, would get the robot to where it needs to be. And you typically use this for the interesting bits of a larger robot program. Right? So you write your standard robot program, the robot moves very fast um, through the boring parts of its motion, right, from A to B. But then for the variance that you have, even in a car factory, where the car never exactly stops at the same point, or um, that you have because your part is soft and jiggles about, or because you have some vibration that never leaves anything in there, or because the part you're handling has been made by hand by a human in the step before, and you don't know exactly what it's shaped like. So all these variances that you inherit from the product or from your logistics um, or whatever else for your suppliers, you inherit some imprecisions um, and our product helps you to do away with them uh, and do it in a super reliable, super robust uh, and easy to train on site by a human fashion. Now answering your question, how do we even do this? How do we make it so robust? Um, part of the trick is neural networks. Uh, some of the robustness you get from uh, neural networks who are unreasonably good at interpolating between examples you show, right? They just work very well um, at this. So you show one extreme and the other extreme and one thing in between and everything in between that will generally work. So if you cover the state space with examples well, Everything in between, if you're working with neural networks and you know what you're doing, will work. You get some of the robustness from the real-time properties because you uh, do not make a single measurement that needs to happen at the highest possible precision. But you get lots and lots of chances uh, to, even if you got it slightly wrong in the previous step, to get it more right in the next step. Um, and the chances that you'll be right increase as you get closer because it's easier to see where you go. So um, we sort of, um, one abstract way of uh, explaining what we're doing is we give machines the autonomy they need to deal with the slight variances you encounter, but we do it in a fashion that is constrained. So the result stays predictable and it stays completely compliant. It does exactly what you want it to do. We're still doing automation. Right? It should not get any ideas. We want it to do this thing and this thing only. And we want it to do it for 20 years uh, in the ideal case and where we're really making money off the line. Yeah. Right? So um, this, the, 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 the autonomy to deal with the variation under those inherited constraints that any reasonable machine needs to have is sort of the magic that we bring um, to the factory. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you a question. As you're explaining what you do, you know, I'm thinking closed loop systems. So when we have a servo control system, we're constantly monitoring the feedback to make yeah. sure things are happening the way we're commanding them to happen. And we can adjust on the fly if there's a little bit more, if we need a little bit more talk to meet, you know, where we need to be and at what time we need to be there. You know, this this motion control systems out there that do that for servos. And um, there's systems that do that for robots too. But it does sound like your system stays connected and, and is a closed loop system. Am I correct? Or is this like a yeah. teach once and then download and you're, you go away? So um, the actual control signal that the software generates is closing a control loop via a camera. 
So this is essentially, I mean, for the veterans and the researchers in the in, in the audience, this is neural network trainable visual servoing. So you have you have a closed loop system that generates a uh, sort of closed loop signal uh, through a camera, um, an RGB RGB image from actually two cameras in most cases. Um, so it isn't as fast as the loop you'll get from the actual server control that's inside the robot. And it sits on top of that, right? We, drill, we still just execute through all the normal um, uh, control loops that the robot already have. By the way, inheriting all the robot safety configuration and properties through that. So there's no shenanigans that we can do from neural networks that uh, the robot can't execute. Um, but uh, yeah, while we're on, which again, isn't the whole application, it's typically some skills that the robot needs to make complicated parts um, of the overall application. Um, the control flow goes from the robot controller, uh, which does essentially position control on the servers, to us, who will have a different control loop on top um, and generate uh, the targets for the servers um, in a correcting fashion in a closed loop from the camera images. Yep, that's what's going on. So a, a standard robot, you would tell it go point A to B, and you may say go point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but it has no eyes. Yes. It just goes exactly where you tell it. And the trickiness of putting a camera in is and I know a lot of the old timers who've been doing this longer than I do remember back, you know, computer vision in the eighties, it was extremely difficult. And you'd never wanted anything to change. Like the part have to come down the conveyor in the same exact orientation every single time. Um, or, you know, I'm over exaggerating, but that yeah. was the gist like lighting changes or, you know, distance to the part changes and it messed Spec up. Everything on the lens, computer it breaks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what you're doing is you're giving the, not only giving the robot eyes, but you're giving it the ability to address variations by using the neural network. And would you mind just for, there may be some of our audience out there who may, they, they hear AI, they hear neural network, but they may not know what neural network is at its, like at its core when you say that, right? I mean, people think a computerized brain, but really scientifically, how would you describe a neural network? So uh, a piece of math that isn't actually that complicated. Um, so, you know, what this system does uh, is you have a camera image, which in reality is three arrays of, um, you know, X times Y mm -hmm. pixel values. So that's just a bunch of numbers. Um, and then you have a large table of coefficients, numbers that look random if you look at them. Mm -hmm. And then you just multiply a bunch of these tables. Um, uh onto the values you get out of the camera, onto the pixels. Um, so this is this is just um, cross products, right? So you multiply this, uh, every table of values that you multiply onto the image is a layer in the neural network. Well, that's what that is. And you do a sequence of these multiplications of coefficient tables, um, and then out comes a 60 vector, which is the displacement for your tool. That's what you send to exec for execution to the robot uh, controller, right? So that's really all there is. We do this 15 times a second. So 15 times a second, we'll get an image, multiply all these tables onto it, uh, get a displacement vector out it, and send it to the robot for execution. Mm -hmm. Now the interesting part is how do you come up with the random looking numbers in the tables? That is the magic, right? Because if they're actually random, your robot will do nonsense. Um, but if you know what you're doing, uh, it will do exactly what you've taught it to do. And you've taught it uh, what to do by recording examples of motions it's supposed to make or positions it's supposed to go to. So it knows what the desired situation looks like in the camera. And it knows what motions you taught it to make to get there by jogging it there or by guiding it by the nose, right? You literally grab the wrist of the robot and there's a force torque sensor connected and then you guide it through that motion. Uh, if you want to teach an actual motion, not just a position. So, and this data gets recorded by the system uh, at deployment time. So this is videos of what the world looks like, including the first frame, which is the situation you want the system to be in, and motions um, that correlate to the video. 
right? So it's the time, it's the, it's the same time series. You just have a video and the motions that the robot make while that video made while the, that video was generated, and you send this pair of motion data and video data um, to our cloud where a bunch of magic happens, and back come the coefficients that you then can use to uh, multiply on your camera image, and then the robot will do the right thing. So that's really all there is going on. Um, the magic that happens there uh, is, of course, where our core know-how is. How do you use this data um, to train neural networks in a fashion that it doesn't just work once? But everybody who's um, even studied control at university has used a neural network uh, to do something like that. And then everybody who's, who, who's done that knows, yeah, I play a bit with the hyperparameters and then uh, maybe, you know, there's a layer that's a bit, it needs to be a bit bigger. So you play around with that, right? We don't have these options uh, in this product because no human sees the data. Uh, so when that data gets recorded uh, on site in your factory um, and then sent for processing, we don't look at it. Uh, there's an algorithm that takes that data and 45 minutes later comes back with coefficients that you can run on your robot and it will do the task and it works every single time. Uh, so this is where the magic happens. Um, it sometimes works slightly better or slightly less. Um, and then you need to add some more data because you've not shown things that happen in the real um, sort of, in the right? So typically this is iterative. Um, you do 10 examples and then it generally works, but there are some situations light situations, material situations, orientations, some of the variants you haven't covered, you haven't shown. So you haven't given the neural network a chance to interpolate to this part of the state space. Um, so you realize that trying the system out. So you add some more data, you do the cycle again, and at some point you'll cover everything that actually happens. Um, yeah. And then the system will be robust against all the things you've shown and everything in between and all the combinations of these things. Yeah, and that's uh, that's important. A lot of people who've not used a system like this may not understand. You really have to cover the 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 what's going to happen. You really have to cover, like you said, lighting changes. A lot of time, even simple sensors will be thrown off by glaring light in the morning when the sun's coming up. And um, even my car, my 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 uh, um, the cruise control, the adaptive cruise control, if the sun's hitting it just at the right angle, it'll give me a braking warning because it thinks somebody's right in front of it. And that's that's why you do have to cover all those different situations. So I think your example of plugging a charger, especially the little ones we have now, into a phone and with a phone may not always be in the same exact millimeter by millimeter spot is a good one. What other application examples could you share with the audience? Like, you know, if, if you have a situation like this, give us a call. Let's talk about your application. Yeah. Like, I, I'm sure you've seen, I know I don't want to talk any customer names or, you know, any, I don't want to ruin any NDAs, but what kind of type of applications out there in manufacturing or other applications do you think you would be a good, your solution is a good fit for? Yeah, let me start in the abstract and then I'll do a couple of very concrete examples of stuff we've done. Um, so in the abstract, whenever you have variants, um, stuff isn't where you want it to be, or it changes shape while you're handling it, or just you have suppliers who you cannot get to be consistent in uh, shape or color or size or rigidity, wherever you have some kind of variance like that. But you do think mechanically the system is solvable, the problem is solvable, right? Sometimes, um, with a two-finger gripper, which, if we're honest, is the only type of end effector we want to, uh, we, we're not going to use hands for a couple of years in industry. They break too easily, right? So with a with a simple two-finger gripper, if you can solve the problem at all, if it would just move right, um, and you have variants to deal with, then it's worth thinking about using our product. Um, okay, what might that be? Um, so that's bread and butter stuff. Bread and butter stuff is things like um, you want to, you know, put in a bolt somewhere and um, the the hole that you put the bolt in is in a slightly different place every time. Maybe you're on a conveyor and your, your uh, sort of fixture that moves with the conveyor is 20 years old and not precise and you want to use a robot anyway. Maybe stuff is in a blister and the blister gets soggy in summer because everything's warmer um, and it's in slightly, uh, it's in a different, it's in a different place where you pick it up. Um, 
maybe you have a bunch of styrofoam and when your conveyor stops, stuff wiggles a bit um, and it never stops in the exact same place. Maybe uh, what you're handling is a cable and there's no way to get it to be in the same place uh, for every part, right? Maybe there's a cable. So let's say you're making, I'm not saying this is an application we did for a customer, but maybe it is. Uh, maybe you're making a re refrigerator and there's a cable hanging out of the back of it. Um, and you want to plug it in and see if it turns on at the end of your line. So today that's a human because there's no way to reliably grab that cable and plug it in. Um, and using our product, you can totally just sort of find the cable, follow the cable to the plug, pick the plug, um, put it in, see if electrically something happens uh, and put it back and move on. So that's that's something where sort of in the old world, everybody would have said, oh, boy, okay, crazy. Either this is a highly complicated mechanical contraption where we sort of move the fridge al along this mechanical thing and then it catches the cable and when we pull it up and then there's a linear axis that pulls it and then there's a thing that orients it and uh, right, that's what we would have built. So there's a, there's a humongous yeah. machine uh, that tries to catch the cable and define its orientation so you can do something with it. With our product, you just teach it to find that cable, grab it and plug it in um, and it works and it works every time. Um, yeah. So, from the world of refrigerators, uh, we do lots of um, testing, electrical testing. Um, one other quite cool thing that I learned was unautomatable for a very long time is leak testing. So every ref refrigerator uh, you have ever bought um, had a human uh, leak test it. Because if you don't leak test it, there is a small chance of the coolant leaking out of the copper tubes where the coolant circulates. And if the coolant leaks out, two things happen. First, your fridge breaks, and second, your kitchen explodes because the, this is essentially lighter fluid um, and you don't want that floating around in your kitchen. Um, so you need to find the solder joints of those copper tubes, which because these things are built by hand, you don't know where they are. And depending how good the guy was who did the soldering, they look very different. <laughs> Um, so one of the applications we've done a bunch of times um, in that industry is find the solder joint, get a probe, a sniffing probe uh, within a millimeter and see if there's even a whiff of coolant leaking out there. Um, and the people who bought this from us and who are running these systems um, have actually done the test, uh, humans versus robots, uh, where the robots will find more deliberately inserted bad examples uh, than the humans do. Because the humans are, of course, very good at this, uh, while a guy in a suit is standing next to them watching them do it. But um, it is a very boring job. Um, you know, holding a sniffing probe up to a solder joint for eight hours a day is just, it's just brutal. Um, and I mean, the people who've done it all their lives, they're kind of fine with it, but they also have real serious problem finding somebody who went to school to do this all their life. Well, and there's a lot of jobs out there in that vein that are the their jobs only humans can do like plugging in the refrigerator or, or doing the sniff test but um they have to rotate people through it because nobody would want to do that yeah. job all day so everybody takes their turn doing the the crummy job but um there's no i mean unless there's a mechanical geniuses out there that can design anything mm -hmm. it's like well we get this little track and we'll have this thing sniff at, or we'll have we can pick up the cord and, and those people are geniuses i love them but those those type of we can do anything with mechanical features is typically extremely expensive to engineer and build and um it's actually cheaper just to hire you know tell everybody all right you get an hour a day on the crummy job Plug in the fridges and I'm sorry, but that has to that has to do it. And I think yeah. those are the type of jobs where they've wanted to use robots for so long and they haven't been able to that maybe your solution is the right fit. Yeah. And um, I mean, I should mention this works with cobots, right? This was developed on cobots. So um, this fridge testing applications, this is actually on cobots. They don't have cages around these stations. The robots are even on wheels. Um, so um, this is often something where, right, if something special happens for four hours, I mean, you sort of run a batch um, that has plugs for a territory you haven't trained the robot for, they can still swap in people. Um, because 
our control system is essentially working relative um, to where the part is, not where the anchor of the robot is. So you can even just you don't even have to precisely lock it uh, to the station. You just roll it up um, and let it do its thing, because it will find the plug and um, and then and then do that. So this works great with cobots. Uh, it's not limited to cobots, though. I mean, we also do um, stuff in automotive that has these properties where you have a bit of variance that you want to do away with. Say you're gluing a windscreen to a car, a very large part. Um, sort of detail of the orientation matter quite a lot. Um, but your car harness isn't precise enough um, to just you know go down uh, with a, a, a big funnel and just press it in. Uh, you need to do a two degree correction there. Um, and that is something the system does on very large industrial robots. So uh, we don't care what the robot is. We're just a bit of math. Um, you can use any tool. You can use any kinematic essentially to get you there as long as we have a driver for it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, are there any, so cobots, I think we're familiar with them and machine tending, I can definitely see really taking advantage of your system because a lot of machine tending applications, the reason that no, they don't have a robot on them right now is because of that variability of where the parts are. But, um, you know, I, I guess, do you supply the cameras or do you have a specification for the cameras you need to work with your system? So um, these are standard boring. Don't tell the people who make them that I said they're boring, but they're boring cameras, right? They, they give, they do nothing special. They give an RGB image and they are selected for reliability and readiness for industrial applications. So right now we support two. There is a USB uh, system by Jimia. Um, and a uh, gigabit Ethernet system by Bauma. Um, so these are the cameras you kind of have to use because uh, you know we do real time, so we need to know about the timings and how they behave. So the system works on a 25 bucks uh, Logitech webcam. It's just not precise and reliable. Uh, so we have sort of narrowed the eligible range of cameras down to something that we know very well, um, and we know the timings of. Um, you don't need to buy them from us. You can buy them from your favorite supplier uh, if you have one. Same goes for the compute hardware that you um, you know put next to the robot controller to run our software on. This is just a Siemens, um, but you can buy the Siemens from us, or you can buy it from uh, from uh, from Siemens directly or whatever your reseller is. Um, the camera isn't that interesting. So uh, often when I talk to people who've done it for a while, right, they will absolutely like to nerd out about uh, the details of the camera. And I'm, I'm, I am sometimes having a hard time not to look bored because I really don't care about the camera. The camera is not the key thing here. It just gives me pixels. Um, and then if, if it absolutely needs to be this camera, I'll write a, the team will write a driver for it uh, and then that's it. Um, one, of, one thing I should notice is you're completely free to play with the optics here. Um, so the neural networks have this nice property because we train them from scratch for every application that they make no assumption about both the camera placement, where it is on your wrist or in your workspace. So you can do everything that works for you. So you get the pixel to know how to make the right, uh, the, the right motion. And you can essentially put any lens on there that suits your application. Um, and there isn't even anything you need to configure in the system because you're just generating data uh, and the data that you use when you that you generate when you're giving examples and the data that you get from the same lens when you execute is the same. Um, so uh, through this property, I mean, we have cases where people do almost 90 degree angles um, of two cameras that are very close together, uh, very close to the workpiece. Um, from that to um, sort of very narrow lenses that are fairly far away because you have limited space um, into where you insert your tool into a machine or something, right? So where you need to be way back with the camera and then you just use a very narrow lens to have enough pixels to see what's going on um, in the front. Two even Omnicam setups where you have sort of a bit of a mirror um, or a cone. Uh, so you see almost a full table uh, to find a certain part that you need. All of this is possible. Um, and all of this gets configured only by putting the lens on and then recording data. 
you don't need to understand the optics um, of that. So often uh, when I talk to uh, computer vision veterans, they, they, they get kind of sad um, because they are very good at this stuff. Um, and I'm telling them, no, neural networks take care of it for you. Um, we don't care, right? All you need to do is look at the image that your optical setup gives you. And if you as a human would know how to move, given the information that's in the image, the system will find it. The system will know how to move. You don't need to tell it how to do that. Um, the, it does not do magic. The one thing you need to pay attention to is, do you see what the motion is? Uh, do you see the feature that the thing needs to see to make the right motion? If you don't have the pixels, it cannot guess it. Um, it needs to rely on the information that actually comes in from the camera. Now that makes a lot of sense. And so I don't I said, was there anything else you wanted to cover? I'm thinking of my questions, but all the questions I have, I think we've already really covered. So I don't want to just go over ground that we've already talked about. Was there anything else we should uh, discuss about your solution here while we're on the meet while we're on the call? Yeah, I mean, let's uh, briefly mention the uh, already supported robot platforms. Um, so this works on URs, all of them. Um, okay. If you want to go Cobot, it works uh, with uh, a large part of the Fanuc range, all the common robots uh, by Fanuc, including the Cobot, the CRX um, works. Um, sometimes uh, if you bring a more exotic one, it takes us a couple of weeks uh, to um, uh, put the kinematic parameters in, which is essentially what we need to do for the Fanucs. Um, and all the KUKAs work, um, full range of uh, KUKA industrial robots, not the Cobots, but um, the full range of industrial robots from KUKA. Um, some of the other platforms uh, that you know to, you would typically use um, are essentially, we know it will work. Uh, we're discussing Kawasaki. Um, we have the, done ABB in the past. Uh, so depending on where the business is, uh, we'll we'll be able to uh, add more platforms uh, quite quickly. All right, great. Yeah, Universal Robots, they have a big lead in the Cobots. Um, we, we do cover ABB, KUKA, um, and a lot of the other uh, Cobot manufacturers out there and, you know, um, other robot systems out there. So well, that's good to know. And I appreciate you coming on the show. I... Um, I'm still, I'll probably be thinking about this for a couple of days, thinking of how cool it is that what you guys are doing and, and how there's going to be all these poor souls out there who no longer have to plug in that refrigerator <laughs> manually all the time. And um, people have been like, yay, that job is gone. The robot can do it now. So, um, Ronnie, I have nothing else for you. Um, was there anything else you wanted to cover before we call it a show? Yeah, let's, let's stay on that for one second. Why do people do it? Right? Why do why do people? I mean, I, think, I guess with your audience, everybody's an automation person anyway. So I don't need to sell the automation, but let me just mention um, the reasons people do is not typically cost. Right? People aren't doing this to save money. Um, it's often a nice side effect, uh, but many of those uh, cases that we see, people want to use a robot for consistency, um, for predictability of results. Uh, even for ergonomic reasons, right? Putting in bolts um, above your head is no fun for everybody, for anybody ever, right? This is just horrible. So yeah. there are there there are there are really a lot of reasons beyond cost uh, to do this. Uh, we don't look down at cost cases; that's also fine. Um, but uh, there, there's really there's really a wide range of uh, reasons to do this, um, and uh, with some of our customers. Um, do have cost cases that are very attractive where you know we're essentially replacing we had one case where we were replacing uh, i think a two shift setup with uh, four robots so this is eight people uh four robots uh, they had a bit of fluctuation on the people who were doing the job because it wasn't fun uh, so there's sort of a lot of cost you need to add to just the salaries of those four people because you needed to keep the station um, uh, manned all the time so I think buying the robots, our system, and doing the engineering, um, they still had ROI on that use case after three months. Wow, three months is really, really good. And <laughs> we're not always safety... as good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there and there's a safety issue when it's a very boring job because it's hard for a person to stay to concentrate on something so simple and so boring that it's it's easy and i know from my personal life it just it's easy um you know when you're doing the same job all the time to 
the uh, you know super safety after you know months of making the same repetitive motions. So it's easy to get distracted and let your mind wander. And um, yeah, and I, and it's and uh, you know personnel is one of the most expensive people. One of the, personnel is one of the most expensive costs a company has. So if you can relieve your your high paid personnel from doing such a, a menial but needful task, that's that's a win win. And, and I imagine the the ROI is usually within a year or so. Yeah. Um, I'm sure not everyone is, but yeah, I can imagine it's usually within a year, a year's salary. I mean, we have we have customers who say, "I don't even care, right? Uh, if you can, I can't hire the people for this job anymore." Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are there are situations that we saw where they said, you know. People aren't coming in for the night shifts anymore. I do not get people um, to uh, do night shifts. However, I have a paint shop and I need a paint shop for this. So the only way to increase my output is uh, build another paint shop. I don't have the money for this, right? So they're in a situation where they need very expensive infrastructure to double their output during the day. And if they want to keep the lights on during the night, they need to automate. So they there there were there were customers that told me, if your ROI is five years, I still don't care because it still means I don't need to build another paint shop to even keep my output uh, stable. So there, there, there is there is good reasons to do that now. And um, I mean, cobots are changing the game already, um, and uh, technology such as ours is changing the game. Um, it's not always easy, right? Uh, this is often uh, these are cases that aren't standard automation stuff anymore, right? You're going beyond what your engineers are used to doing. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve um, to just trust a system like that. Um, so I, I like to compare our product to sort of a, a powerful tool of wizardry. Uh, it doesn't do magic instantly. You need to become a wizard, right? You need to learn how to give it data. But then once you've learned it, everybody will think you do magic uh, because you're doing things that nobody else uh, has ever thought of doing uh, very quickly. Catch all the different possible instances for the job, and then the, the your system fills in the gaps so it can do work with all of those. And uh, yeah, that makes sense. Reminded me of like Harry Potter and the wands. You know, just having yep. a wand didn't make them perfect. They had to learn all this. They're they oh, they had they're, to do the wiggling and whatever it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It did. And so yeah, and you're gonna do it in different lighting conditions. If the light changes throughout the day, if you don't have a light there, if, if the part changes, the color of the part changes based on whatever. All these different things. But once you get those in there, the, your your system, the neural net, can extrapolate between all of those and give you the solution as you're honing in the, the plug in that, whatever that part is, or do whatever you need to do. And so that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. The, uh, the teams that are customers that have done this the longest, this is typically large automotives, where there's typically one team of people who you know initially found us and started to do it. These guys are better at doing uh, skills than our own engineers. They're, they're getting so good at this because they're doing it under real conditions in the real factory, um, solving problems we have never heard about. Um, so it's really sometimes they show us things they've done with the system uh, because we don't look at their data, right? It just passes through the algorithms. And we, we will look at it. This is possible. Okay. Uh, this was bold. Very good that you made it work. Very impressive. So yeah. Yeah, those and are the best th customers. These are our yeah. favorite customers, obviously, right? They who yep. surprise us by their uh, skill with the system. Yeah, and every every engineer knows every, that an operator can show him something that he never thought would happen, usually within five minutes. So, yeah, um, yeah that's that type of feedback is is priceless. Yeah. yeah. So, was there anything else we wanted to cover? I think we would. All right, Ronnie. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I really enjoyed talking to you, and um, very uh, you have a very interested uh, interesting company and product and uh i hope everybody who's watching will go check out their website um i'll put it up on the screen if you're watching the video right now and we hope to get the links in the description um before it releases but ronnie thank you again for coming on the show and i really appreciate your time today thank you very much for the invitation and a very engaging conversation thank you well i hope you enjoyed that episode and i want to thank ronnie from microsoft for coming on the show i also want to thank his company for sponsoring this episode 
making it completely ad-free. Wasn't that great? If you did enjoy this episode, though, please give us a like and consider a sub and a share. You know, the likes that you give our show is really the only way we can grow our audience and find new vendors to come on the show. So if you do enjoy it, please give us a like and consider giving us a sub and a share. Now, if you guys want to connect with me directly on LinkedIn, you can do so. My username is Mr. Sean Tierney, Mr. Sean Tierney. And um, you should be able to find me there. You can also find insights and automation, my company up there. If you know anybody looking for PLC, HMI, or SCADA training, please send them over to the automationschool.com. I not only do online courses, which I've been doing for over 10 years now, but I now also offer in-person classes. I just had a Rockwell class last week. Next week, I'm doing a Siemens class. So if you want to get some in-person training, I typically can train four people for four days for less than it would cost you to send one person to the factory for one week. So it's a much better deal in my opinion, and they're custom. I'll cover whatever you want. As long as I know how to use the product, I'm more than happy to cover it. So with that said, I want to wish you all an awesome week. I want to wish you good health and happiness. And until next time, my friends, peace.